Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we'll get started. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my close colleague and co-mentor. We co-mentor <laughs> each other, uh, Dr. Tiara Tanksley, who is Assistant Professor of Equity, Diversity, and Justice in Education at uh, CU Boulder. And uh, Tara has been a longtime uh, friend of UCI and the Connected Learning Lab, uh, worked as a postdoc with us for a couple of years and has continued to collaborate. Uh, initially, we got to know each other because of the work around um, STEM and computer science equity work. And Tara joined one of our projects on out of school STEM programming. Uh, but then we've been doing a lot of work together on yes. the digital well-being stuff, which is actually more closely linked to Tiara's uh, dissertation work with um, uh, Black girl activists and looking at their health and well-being, um, which I'm sure you're, you're going to talk about yeah. that today. Okay, so you'll get to hear more about that. But, um, you know, it's just been such a delight working with Tiara. We have a lot of shared interests around you know, ethnographic approaches to youth and their engagement with technology. But Tara's brought so much expertise and wisdom around critical race theory and applying it in really thoughtful ways to the work that we do that I've learned so much from her and I'm really looking forward to learning more today. And I hope you will too. So oh my gosh. please welcome Tiara. Um, that was like a special moment. I always say Mimi's my auntie, my academic auntie, which is like if you, you know, black culture, like that is like the highest honor. So <laughs> thank you, Mimi. Okay, so hey y'all, I'm Dr. Tier Tanksy. Um, and my presentation today is going to be called Debugging Black Death in the Digital: How Black Youth Survive, Resist, and Redesign Anti-Black Technologies Towards Collective Change. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Good way to start. Okay, so I'd like to start all of my presentations um, by talking about some of my mentors, um, because my, my research agenda is kind of in a, a lot of different areas. And so um, I like to say that I worked um, with Dr. Sophia Noble and Dr. Tyrone Howard when I was at um, doing my PhD at UCLA. And my work is very much at the intersection of their research. So Dr. Sophia Noble looks at algorithmic racism and Dr. Tyrone Howard looks at the experiences of black youth in schools, particularly black boys. And then I did a postdoc, as Mimi said, here at UCLA where I started getting into um, computer science and STEM equity. So I also have research now that looks at um, issues of, you know, racism and anti-Blackness in STEM spaces. I also recently finished a fellowship at UCLA in Dr. Safiya Noble's lab, um, where I was awarded the Emerging Leader in Critical Race Technology Studies. I also like to note that um, outside of like my, you know, research, I also do teaching. So I was a K-12 teacher for many years, and I did a lot of work on designing curriculum that focuses on play and like racial joy. So you're going to see a little bit of all of that in today's talk. So um, I also like to kind of do an overview of my research agenda, again, because it's so transdisciplinary. So um, these are the three kind of bodies of scholarship that I'm in. So the first one is youth resistance and algorithmic racism, which I always attribute to Safiya Noble. So this is my research where I look at um, activism online and some of the digital harms um, that come from algorithmic anti-blackness being the default setting of digital systems. Um, the second image here is um, a student named um, Muhammad who brought a science experiment. This story went viral not too long ago, um, but he bought, brought a, a disassembled clock to school and his teachers thought he was um, bringing a bomb. So they called the police and he was arrested on campus. And so this body of scholarship for me, which I believe is related to my work with Dr. Mimi Ito, is about the STEM plus education um, and the school to prison pipeline and how that is actually being facilitated by the new gym code, right? Thinking about the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and how e-systems and e-learning technologies are actually facilitating this new gym code, as Dr. Rob Benjamin says. And then this third body of work is about school discipline algorithms. From again, the new Jim Code. This image is actually, um, this happened in 2020. A young Black girl uh, failed to complete her remote learning homework in March 2020, and she was sent to prison, right? Um, and so really thinking about how technology, racism, um, and then edu education are really tied together. So I also like to do a little positionality. Um, so growing up, in the communities that I was in, low-income Black and brown urban communities, there were particular messages about technology and my anticipated relationship to technology, right? And so these are some of the images, some of them from online, but others from my actual community, where you can see that the central organizing logic of these technologies when they're in historically marginalized communities is about extraction, right? It's about um, death, it's about coercion, containment, 
our communities are often the places where our resources are extracted, right? Our resources are deprived from our communities and they're used to fuel other communities. And I always point to the, the image in the, in the corner because that's actually Inglewood, right? Where we have like the oil rigs um, and our schools up at the top are often, you know, mediated by carceral technologies such as the body scanners and other uh, surveillance systems. I grew up in the valley. This is an image of a, a junkyard that's in the valley. So always the message is that racialized Black death and dying is the central organizing feature of these systems. Oh, this one. Okay. I didn't know this was a moving slide. Okay. So the, I'm going to get done, get into some of my theoretical frameworks. But essentially, my research question has always been, how can we understand Black death and dying as a socio-political, socio-technical, and an educational phenomenon? And in order to do that, um, at the time I was doing my dissertation research, there wasn't a theory that actually looked at all three of those things simultaneously. So I did what Black girls do, right? I began to braid. I did a three-strand twist, right? So I'm looking at Black feminist and abolitionist thought as a body of work, critical race theory and education, and critical science and technology studies. So I wanted to understand Black death and dying as kind of like um, a conceptual framework, right? That doesn't just include the physical death of the body, but also spirit murder. And that was the work from Dr. Bettina Love. Um, and she actually provides this beautiful quote in her work on abolitionist teaching, where she says, race-centered violence kills Black children on a daily basis by either murdering them in the streets, taking their bodies, or murdering their spirits, taking their souls. Spirit murdering within a school context is the denial of inclusion, protection, safety, nurturance, and acceptance because of fixed yet fluid and multiple structures of racism. So here I'm starting to think about physical Black death and dying, right? Spiritual Black death and dying, and how that is mediated by structures of racism. Then I looked at critical race theory and education, and Dr. Chester Pierce, who's considered like the father of you know, microaggression theories, right? explains racism following the civil rights movement as being this new form of racism that was more mundane and, and, and subtle. And he says, one must not look for the gross and the obvious. The subtle cumulative mini assault is the substance of today's racism. Microaggressions are put downs, seemingly innocent, that can cold, <laughs> could slowly crush the human spirit under a devastating burden, leading to a lack of self-esteem and confidence and eventually to shorter lives. So here again, we see the connection of these small um, harms, right, that lead to, lead to shorter life expectancy. And we know there's research on this, right, in the biological sciences about how microaggressions actually um, release cortisol, they shorten your telomeres, and it leads to shortened life. So then I went to critical science and technology studies where I found Ruha Benjamin's work um, where she talks about microaggressions in a very different way. She says, um, it's about the way racism gets under the skin and into the placenta, restricting blood flow so that Black American babies are disproportionately born premature due to the accumulation of stress and strain shouldered by expected mothers. These microchips accumulate in the seemingly soft wear and tear that exposes Black lives to death even before birth. So here I am understanding these combinations of race, technology, and Black death and dying. Then I also started thinking about debugging. And I started thinking about microaggressions as types of bugs in the code, right? So thinking about bugs as small, seemingly mundane errors in a codified system that produce profound and sometimes destabilizing consequences, particularly for the user, right? So merging all these theories and I started to look for bugs in the code. So this is my dissertation study, which I'll talk about very briefly. It was called Race, Education, and Black Lives Matter, um, where I actually was studying the experiences of Black girls online who were engaging in social media activism. And my findings, I mean, I overwhelmingly found that Black girls were experiencing what they were calling PTSD from seeing constant images of Black people dead and dying. They were also having discrete, extremely high rates of digital harassment and assault, with many of them, when they would post about Black Lives Matter, many of them were receiving hundreds of thousands of bot-generated hate speech, right, um, and threats, and they were being doxxed. And then they also noticed that their posts were being deleted, right? So I found that all of this, you know, this complex nexus of digital mediated trauma had educational Im um, impacts where they had a hard time engaging in their classes, they were disassociating, they were desensitized, uh, they had all of these, you know, ramifications. And um, here, because I don't have time to do this study, but here are some of the images I found because again I was looking for 
the bugs in the code. I wanted to know why were Black girls being disproportionately harmed in these same ways, right? Why were their posts being deleted? And I ended up finding out that during the time of this study, this top image is Facebook's content moderation um, manual that they use to train their content moderation systems and their human, uh, you know, backup content moderators. And it says, um, which one of the below subsets do we protect? Female drivers, Black children, or white men? And the correct answer, which somehow got cropped out of this, what do I? Um, I, I think big tech, but really it was me. I didn't think it was <laughs> um, It says white men, right? And so systemically and systematically, black children are, leave, are left hyper exposed to hate speech, right? They're actually algorithmically unprotected from hate speech. Meanwhile, white men are. So at the time when my black female participants are saying that they can't actually get any support from getting these digital hate speech, that they report them and the algorithms say this isn't actually hate speech and they leave the comments up that this is actually what's happening. Simultaneously, Google released a study in 2020 that said its most searched terms had to do with Black Lives Matter. And unsurprisingly, the most searched queries had to do with Black men dead and dying. And I actually disaggregated the data to understand what were some of the related terms, right? So the top five terms were George Floyd, Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, um, and when I disaggregated the data, these show the related terms. So for Trayvon Martin, it's Trayvon Martin body, Trayvon Martin dead, Trayvon Martin pictures, Trayvon Martin dead body. And it's the same for all of them, right? George Floyd chokehold, George Floyd video, George Floyd autopsy. And this is because Black death and dying has always been a monumentally lucrative commodity in the US, right? So Black death goes viral, not because it's going to somehow bring about racial change or, or you know, um, reform on law enforcement and our criminal injustice system. Them, it's because which each one of these clicks, right? They make profit. We have click rates that go from 38 cents roughly all the way up to six dollars, depending on the platform. And when you think about that, when George Floyd's video went viral, it was watched 2.4 billion times. So just think about how much money Black Death and Dying accumulates. So then I moved, so this was a study where I was kind of understanding the implications of anti-Black algorithms outside of schools. So then I looked into schools. And this is a study I did in a computer science classroom um, where I was really just there to learn about um, how Black girls were engaging with computer science, how they were using ed tech. And I found overwhelmingly in the year that I was there that the educational technologies and the other school-based technologies were actually increasing their contact with the criminal justice system, as I said earlier, vis-a-vis -vis the new Jim Code. And this came up in a couple of ways. First, there were analog algorithms, right, rules, disciplinary rules, that left Black girls hyper-visible and hyper-vulnerable to push out. So there was a lot of rules around you know, what you could use your computer for, your school computer for. Um, they had to wear uniforms, there were behavioral rules, things like that. And at the beginning of my study, there were six girls. And by the end of the study, there were only four. And that's because two of them were pushed out, they were expelled for violating digitally mediated disciplinary rules. So one student brought their phone to school, and she was immediately expelled because this was a zero tolerance school. Um, and the other student was being cyber bullied outside of school, and she went in school to address it, and she also was expelled for being being confrontational. And so here again, unfortunately, at the end of the school year, when I asked the other participants what happened, you know, have you been in contact with your, your friends? They um, said that the first student actually joined a girl gang, and that was her only way of kind of um, maintaining a sense of a community. And so she had early contact with the criminal justice system, and the other student became unhoused. And so we can see how these digitally mediated practice and the implementation of school-based surveillance and safety systems are actually harming Black students disproportionately. Simultaneously, the four girls who remained in this computer science classroom were tasked with making computer science projects that were supposed to center their life experiences. So they were supposed to use code.org to do like a story, code a story that represented their life, use Scratch to do the same thing. The goal wasn't necessarily to make a story about your life, right? The goal was to learn the technical features. However, because these systems weren't designed to actually have built-in features that represented the Black girls' lives, right? They didn't have avatars at that time that looked like Black girls who had their hair. Um, they had mermaids or other other types of you know fantastical creatures. So they were concerned about actually representing themselves in these technologies. But when they tried to do that, because there weren't any built-in avatars, so they went above and beyond, they found images, they tried to upload their own images into Scratch. And because there was so much footage and, and data being uploaded, the system isn't actually built to have that type of storage in mind. So their projects consistently crashed and deleted. And so they actually all failed their projects in Scratch 
and they couldn't figure out why these projects were failing. Meanwhile, their white colleagues who already had their avatar set up and their storyline set up that they could just drag and drop into Scratch passed within a day, right? And so we can see how this discriminatory design is quietly creating educational disparities, right? Even when these technologies are brought in a way to advance educational access, right? And then obviously the black girls being the black girls that they are like me, they found ways to hack these systems. And so when Nipsey Hussle died, um, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with Nipsey Hussle, but he is, uh, or he was a activist, a community activist and a rapper. And the girls actually knew him personally. They were part of his community. So when he was killed, we were actually in the middle of an e-textiles project and they decided to make their e-textile project about Nipsey Hussle to honor him. Um, they were getting pushback before Nipsey passed about playing hip hop music out loud. Um, the school security guards would come by and say, hey, you can't use, you, can, you can't play that. That's inappropriate, right? Um, the content moderation systems built into their computers would block them from going to like BET.com or going to see Nipsey Hustle videos on YouTube, right? And whenever they violated these content moderation protocols, their principal would be made aware, right? So it was a risky endeavor to try to engage in Black culture at school vis-a-vis -vis the school computers. But with this project, they were actually able to code his songs into their e-textiles so they could play Nipsey Hustle out loud and not get in trouble because now it was tethered to computer science. So that project, at the end, when I was interviewing the students about their experiences as Black girls in computer science, um, one of the students, Heaven, and that's her pseudonym, I, I asked her, you know, how, how did you survive? How did you survive the system that was so, you know, problematic? She said, we had to learn how to change to flip the switch. And she was talking about learning how to code switch, right? She talks about the beginning of the school year, they were very loud, right? And she said, the communities that we come from were loud. And that's, that's something that's joyous, right? Like that's something that shows that like, we're having a great time, it's our community. But in this school, uh, it's seen as something negative. So we kept getting in trouble for being loud. We kept getting in trouble for like playing hand games and doing the things that black girls do when they play. So we had to learn how to code switch, right? To perform this other version of blackness. And me being the tech person I am, I thought about code switching and flipping the switch as turning on and off the system of power. So what does it mean to be able to turn off an anti-black system, right? And instead of code switching, changing to put that system, what if we actually switch the codes? the computational codes. And so here, so the takeaway from this study was that in both of these studies, whether it was the social media activism or the computer science classroom, that the students, the Black students I was working with, were able to subvert and resist analog systems of anti-Black violence, right? Like they understood how to address George Floyd's murder by using social media technology, but they were not fully equipped with the computational skills necessary to subvert and resist digital systems of anti-Black violence. They didn't understand that the algorithms were creating these disproportionately harmful experiences for them. So at this juncture, I was like, I want to do something different. How do I address this, right? I can't keep merely identifying algorithmic racism. How do I move towards disrupting algorithmic racism? And so there's this Ghanaian term, it's called Sankopa, and it basically means um, you can't really understand any contemporary issue without going back historically and finding the roots of the problem, right? One of the myths of white supremacy is ahistoricism, that somehow this problem just emerged out of nowhere. We have no idea how to solve it. We have no idea where it came from, right? But actually, all of these problems are deeply rooted. And so Sankofa means to go back and get it. And so hopefully one of my slides didn't get it. OK, because <laughs> you know I'd be out here accidentally deleting stuff. So if I go back and get it, and I re-look at these images of the communities I grew up in, I understand that Black communities have always hacked these systems to create fugitive spaces of Black joy, hope, and healing. And in each one of these images, you can see where some, someone disrupted the system, whether it's the graffiti. Um, I don't know about y'all, but like I used to hang out on these all the time. Okay, like that was like the spot. So we, I don't even know, I always say, I don't know what that was for, but like we were all hanging out on that. It was like the most joyous location in the hood. Um, you can see, you know, a girl soccer team playing in front of the, the oil rigs. And actually my dad used to always take me to the junk yard and used to get all our car parts from there. So these were always systems that we had, right? Despite these being meant to be black death and dying, death making systems as as Dr. Um, Ruha Benjamin says that we were actually making them into joyous life giving systems. And so just to go back, 
um, not Sophia, bless her heart, that's my advisor, but Dr. Ruha Benjamin <laughs> so, um, to hack the system, one needs an in-depth understanding of how it works, its strengths and its weaknesses, and a vision of how to make it better, to make it do something it wasn't meant to do. And that's why I say we used to hack these systems, because we were making them do something they weren't meant to do. So I come back to this notion of debugging. And if you've noticed throughout this presentation, I've really been kind of bending and breaking and blurring the boundaries between what we, we, we define as social science and what we define as the applied or computational sciences. So here I look at debugging a little bit differently. So what I was told growing up was that debugging was um, an idea that came from a female computer scientist who there was this issue where like the servers and systems were down and they couldn't figure out what happened. Was it the code, right? Like what was going on with the system? And she ended up finding out that it was a moth that was stuck in the system. Mm -hmm. And they removed the moth, and that's actually what regenerated the system. And so my question is, what does it mean that something so small and so tiny could have disrupted and dismantled and destabilized an entire system? And further, what does it mean for Black folks to be the moth in the system, right? To be able to dismantle these systems and make it do something it wasn't meant to do, right? Center Black life and living. So I've been theorizing this notion of abolitionist tech design with all of these features that I've kind of covered today. Um, so in the following slides, I'm going to show you a class that I teach at UCLA with Black youth. But these are some of the design principles um, where, again, I'm blending these bodies of scholarship. So first, we kind of do debugging, um, which I, I talk to students about ha like it's having an awareness of a racist bug and a plan to fix it. There's also hacking, making a system do something it wasn't meant to do, right? Instead of centering Black death, we're centering Black life. And then bugging, right? And so this, this came from the youth because there's ways of talking about bugging that are more um, reminiscent of AABE, Black English, right? So saying like, she was bugging, she was wilding, right? Like a system is, is wilding out. And uh, <laughs> alternatively, when you're bugging out, it's normally like you're bringing wreck or something. Like, yeah, girl, I was bugging out. Right, like you definitely you handled it, <laughs> you dismantled it. So talking about bugging as being this way of bringing death making systems to their knees, right? Fighting back, bringing wreck to these systems. And finally, freedom dreaming, which is Dr. Um, Robin Kelly's work, who's over at UCLA, who talks about freedom dreaming as being something that is inherently the Black experience. And as somebody who um, has a family history, you know, I'm fifth generation free slave. My grandmother grew up on the plantation that her grandparents were enslaved on. It's called the Opal's Beef Plantation. It is still there to this day in Sardis, Georgia. Um, but Kelly talks about freedom dreaming as something that came from our ancestors who were enslaved, that they had this audacious, reckless, dream of freedom and they had no reason to believe that there would ever be a different system. The system of plantation slavery and, and chattel slavery was so pervasive and so sedimented that there wasn't a reason to believe it would ever be something different. And yet they recklessly believed otherwise, right? Even if they did, they, they worked to dismantle it, even if it would never be dismantled in their lifetime. And because they each made little movements towards changing the system, eventually, right, for my grandmother, her kids, and for me, we no longer live in that system. And so we think about freedom dreaming in the digital as making, having these audacious dreams, right? These robust and reckless dreams of a future where anti-Blackness is not the default setting. And we simultaneously start, start to do little steps towards changing it. So you're gonna see some of that in our upcoming slides. So building abolitionist tech with Black youth. This is my critical race tech class. This summer will be year three. So I normally start um, this class features Black youth in high school, um, all in Southern California, and they all go to low-income Title I schools, and this is a college prep program where they get college credit to go to UCLA or any other university, um, and my course is one of the courses that they teach. So I normally start um, because nobody has prior experience to computer science, right? Like, they also did not sign up for this, so they show up and they're like, what, are you doing computer science? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Um, so we start with what are algorithms, right? And they often are like something with having to do with the computer. And I like to, again, blend the social science and the applied slash computational sciences by saying algorithms are a set of rules, right? Um, a, set, a set of logical associations. We also we often think of them as like if-then statements. If I were to like really like make it super simple, an if-then statement, right? Functions. They're like, okay, because they're high schoolers, they're in like algebra. They're like, okay, yeah, no, I get that. And then I say, you know, we can also think about algorithms as racial logics, right? Or the racial calculus that we do to make determinations about Black people's humanity. We think about like the three-fifths compromise, 
right? That was an algorithm to understand Black humanity and how to navigate and, and, and determine outcomes for Black folks, right? So if we think about algorithms in the analog context, I say, let's think about the algorithm for Trayvon Martin, right? What was the if-then statement that mediated his humanity? And a student said, okay, so that would be if a Black boy is wearing a hoodie and in a white neighborhood, perhaps after dark, then he's a dangerous thug who should be thought shot, right? These are the algorithms, the analog algorithms, where Black death and dying is the central organizing logic. And then I also show this image of Walmart in Burbank. I took this image when I was grocery shopping. And this is the one aisle in this entire Walmart, and in matter of fact, in any Walmart I've ever been in, where food and chemicals are in the same aisle. So if you look at the sign, I know it's a little blurry, it says in this aisle it's bleach, tortillas, laundry detergent, and international foods. Discriminatory design, right? Racialized death is at the center. So once we talk about what offline algorithms are like, we start getting into some of the technical. So normally I show them a case study or a user problem. And this is a viral case that happened, you know, not too long ago, I would say in the last decade, where um, a black youth tried to upload their photos and Google image recognition system tagged him and his friend as gorillas. So you could see this in the first image. And so then he actually then does his own experiment and he uploads a bunch of pictures and he says, it's, it's not only the photos I have with my friend where it's tagging gorilla, it's all of these other photos, right? So the students are like horrified. They're like, what the hell is going on? Is it loading? Okay. So then we do a little bit of our own research and I have them do Google image searches. And we do things like we Google search three white teenagers and we look at the results. And then we Google search three black teenagers and we look at the results. So we're talking, we start talking about how is this possible? Is this an accident? Is this just the most relevant, accurate results, right? How do, how does, how do these patterns come up? So then we start learning a little bit of the technology and we do, um, this is AI, this is teachable machines on um, the AI playground. And we start to talk about how a data corpus is collected and tagged and how, how do you think these images were coded so that they came up, those images of mugshots came up for three black teenagers. How were those coded? How can we code them otherwise? And so in this program, you can actually, it gives you like options to drag and drop your own images to code two separate sets of data. And this is a screenshot of a student coding their, their very first one, they were doing professional hair because in one of their experiments, they typed in professional hair and images of white people came up. And they typed in unprofessional hair and images of black people came up. So this was them recoding professional hair to have images of black people. We also talked about everyday hacking, right? So I don't know if y'all remember when this happened, uh, but somebody Google bombed uh, 45. And so when you typed in idiot into Google search, these were the images that came up, right? Making a system do something it wasn't meant to do. And then this is where nah, they was bugging, right? So in 2020, because the first time I taught this class, it was in summer 2020, and the students were actually, all of us had left class early to attend the global demonstration for George Floyd. Um, and we saw in real time on Twitter, the launch of the iWatch app. Um, LA has this now, but at the time it was Dallas. And so Dallas gets on Twitter and they post iWatch and they say, hey, if y'all have seen any crimes at these protests, Right? If you see Black people protesting the killing of their people, take pictures of it and upload it to our system so that we can then arrest them. And so actually when this happened, they thought people were going to you know, engage in being the vigilantes. Um, black folks just dismantled the entire app. Right, They just uploaded like random shit. It was like K-pop videos and Tupac music videos and all kinds of stuff, so much so that the app crashed. And then the police came back and said, um, my, our bad, um, the app is, you know, it's out of, it's out of, out of function right now, but we'll be back. But like, this is everyday hacking, right? And so my students were saying, yeah, no, nah, they was bugging. Like I watched was bugging. And so that's what kind of begin, we started to think about other versions of bugging, right? So you can be bugging in this way, but you can also be bugging in the way of like, you're about to bring wreck to a system. So we also looked at abolitionist counter technologies, right? 
technology is built by and for Black folks. And so we looked at Appalachian, which is a crowd um, crowdsourcing app, where if you enroll into this uh, program, it rounds up your spare change to donate to bail, um, where folks who are, are experiencing socially engineered poverty, who they get incarcerated because they can't play their, pay their bail, pay their bail, right? You're getting incarcerated because you're poor. Uh, this actually pays off their bail funds. Um, and we also talked about Blackbird, which is a, a browser designed by um, Black programmers. So you know how like on Pinterest, if you want to find like hairstyles, you can't just type in like cute hairstyles because it'll just be images of white people. You have to keep, type in cute hairstyles for Black women, and then it comes up with Black hairstyles. So in this app, you don't have to do the qualifier of Black folks. Like it just is built into the system. So we talked about that as well. So all along, I began to kind of piece together what have I been doing? What have I what have I been actually teaching them? Can I name it? Like the way that I think about technology, I want to put a name to it. So I've been thinking about this as critical race computational thinking, right? And computational thinking is defined as, you know, in its most rudimentary form, it's being able to uh, use problem solving skills to break a larger problem down into more manageable pieces, right? And so if critical race theory is the root of our logics, right, then the major problem would be anti-Blackness and it would be working to break anti-Blackness down into these smaller pieces, right, such as maybe anti-Black algorithms on social media and solve those. So we get to the end of the summer and the students are supposed to put together everything they learned to do um, an abolitionist tech project. They're gonna dream up and design a tech project. And I give them this critical race computational thinking rubric. Um, so for all the teachers out there, I don't know if there are teachers out there. Um, I love a good rubric. So I'm not gonna go in depth to this, um, but there's like five components that we look at for their project. And they work in groups of five to design these projects. But the first is a clear critique of anti-Black racism. The second is a techno-social solution to anti-Black racism. So this is really about your project should work to heal rather than harm, right? Marginalized communities. The third, an intersectional and accessible design. Who are you designing for? Who's left out of your design? An incorporation of experiential knowledge, right? You're not just designing by yourself. You need to engage your community. So we encourage them to go out and interview their families, their friends, right? Get data in collaboration with their communities. And then finally, a justice-oriented infrastructure. So how do your infrastructures, your architectures, your code, your algorithms, your content moderation systems, et cetera, center the needs, interests, and experiences of Black users? And so these last slides for the projects. And so one of these other design features, <laughs> yes, after five weeks of working with me, these are the projects that come up. So. Um, and we, we had a lot of fun in this too, because Black joy as a design feature, pedagogically and computationally is really important to me. Again, I want to prepare these students to design technologies differently. I don't want them to go into CS fields and simply copy paste, right? And regurgitate the same anti-Black systems. I want them to do something, do something different. I want them to center Black life and living, right? So group number one, I'm only going to share a couple projects, so I don't have a lot of time, uh, but group number one made the Karen Captures app, and um, they explain it as a GPS similar to Waze, right? And so they said, you know, when Waze gives you the alerts of, like, the police, police have been spotted in 25 feet, like, this is like Karen has been spotted in 25 feet, um, and they're like, because we want to avoid the nonsense, right? We want, we want Black youth to be able to go to school, because they also talked about when they're walking to school, sometimes they got to pass problematic people, like, they want to be able to avoid that. It's almost like a green book, if y'all know about the, the green book. Um, okay, so then they get into, so we're like, how are you gonna do this, right? So they say, okay, we're gonna have a Karen camera, and it's an image recognition system. And just like they have cameras that are designed, um, like the predictive policing cameras that are trained overwhelmingly, disproportionately on black faces, right? So that they over identify black faces. We wanna do it on folks who've been accused of Karenism, right? Who have been documented as Karens. So if you got pictures of Karens on social media, like we're gonna do crawls, right? We're gonna get all of the posts that have been about Karens. We're gonna make this community generated corpus. 
Um, and that was really important to them because that also they were also worried about the onus of reporting being on Black folks, right? Constantly having to be on the lookout and constantly having to be the person to report versus having a system that was set up which already had the database in place, right? They had a lot of other features too. They also had like a care and rehabilitation system because they believed in <laughs> restorative justice. So they were really thinking critical. They were like, we just want to make sure that Karen, you know, decarenizes. <laughs> Um, this group, this one, I think we laughed probably the most at. This was called Ally Shock. And they said, you know, it's an app that just gives you a little bit, just a little bit of a shock if you go through your Bible recipe. <laughs> we were like, um, is it ethical? And they were like, oh, no, no, no. It's like, it's like a little shock. I'm like, okay. Um, and so <laughs> this was, you know, they were saying there's a lot of like, um, how do we say this? Like folks who talk the talk but don't want to walk the walk is what they said, right? A lot of allies out here who want to say that they're doing all of this work to support us, but actually they're they're a lot of times being very violent. So this would be a system that helps them, you know, be reflective. And then a student said, well, how do we make sure people aren't just going to opt in to get shocked? Like, how are you going to make sure that people are going to like get this app? And they said, oh, well, you know how technology now is opt out culture. So all of these features in your iPhone are just built in, right? <laughs> And so you don't have a choice. It's just part of the like operating system. Is that if you want to opt out, we're going to make it real difficult. Like you're going to have to do a verification package. You're going to have to have reference letters. Like back when Twitter actually had a legitimate verification system, like it was like that. And we're like, oh, okay. So like they're they're using the knowledge of you know everyday systems to create these different abolitionist systems. Um, and I have many more, but I'm at time. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Karen. This was an amazing talk. Um, uh, the question probably won't surprise a lot of the people know, but uh, you were talking about analog code switching earlier, and I was kind of curious what you meant by that. Yeah. Um, so this is a concept that comes out of, I would say, like early education scholarship around like language um, and African-American vernacular. So essentially, I've been code switching in this conversation. So when I start speaking Black English and I say, and then I was talking, about, I was like telling her, you know, like that's me speaking Black English. And then I can switch into academic English where I say, oh, the heteronormative patriarchy, right? <laughs> Um, and so there's been a lot of research on code switching and how Black folks, you know, you speak one language, you speak your home language, right? And then you come to school and you speak, you speak school language. Um, and how Black folks have learned that if they don't code switch into languages that are legible um, and palatable to white folks, that they experience punitive um, harm. So when I was in school, actually, I was in kindergarten and I was speaking Black English and I got sent out of the classroom and they told me, because I said ain't, and she said ain't isn't a word and it's broken English, right? And so then I came home and I, and, and my grandma, right, from the South, for the, if you, if you want to know my grandmother from the South, okay, she said ain't, and I said, Grams, ain't isn't a word. And I never made that mistake again. <laughs> um, but we had a real intense conversation about how you are not going to go to these schools and lose who you are, right? So you are going to continue to speak and love and learn Black English while you learn that other language. You're going to be bilingual, right? Um, so that's code switching. Yes, I absolutely know that. <laughs> so the other one? Analog side of it. You're saying not online. Oh, are you? Oh, so I was saying. So they they were speaking about analog code switching. So that's how I define analog. So when I was saying uh, switching the code, actually engaging in coding, like computer coding, differently. So instead of coding something like you know how. I was th we were looking at like if then functions, and it was something like uh, we had an Apple technician come in and did a talk around. Um, what was it like fairness how they how they look at fairness and he showed us an if then equation of like image recognition and essentially it was like if like the person is doing this then it means happy like if they're smiling then it means happy right and so we started talking about well okay if there was an image of a, an asian person it wasn't recognizing them as smiling like it kept saying oh your eyes are closed right which is like deeply racist so we talked about how do we switch that code where it wouldn't be giving us deeply racist and offensive results. So it's switching the code is just a way of talking about how do we code with justice and race in mind at the forefront.
Right. Okay. So I, I think I'm not being clear. Um, so when you say analog code switching, you're just talking about code switching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Hey, thanks for coming. Oh, sorry, I couldn't talk through it. <laughs> yeah, and thanks again for coming. And yeah, I agree. It was a great talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about the slide you had where you talked about trauma? And I guess which one? Which one? Um, it was of course the top, and it was like the framework you had. I think it was the framework that you did that had trauma in the title. Closer to the beginning of the talk. Is it the social media study or the Computer science. They both had a little bit of trauma in it. Okay, well, that's better for my question. Then. I guess what I was wondering, could you yeah. talk a little bit um, just more about trauma, what you understand it to be, and how it figures in your work? The reason I ask is that we have been talking in my lab a lot about trauma, just kind of kept coming up. And one thing that we were talking about was how trauma in research, especially in kind of technology facing research, at one point, at one point meant something like head injury, uh -huh. but then like now it's taking on a kind of collective mm -hmm. meaning. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you could talk about what you understand trauma to be and how you use it. Yeah, um, and so my work on trauma is really situated in like um, racialized trauma literature um, and thinking about, um, so it really is a broader view, definitely not operating from like the head injury singular um, notion of trauma, but thinking about racial trauma. So all of the different ways that whether it's microaggressions, like, you know, the everyday mundane invalidations um, that accumulate into physical stress um, and have anticipatory bodily alarm response similar to PTSD, like scientists are actually seeing that experiencing racism produces the same types of responses as PTSD. And also another study, um, found that black kids in um, urban neighborhoods similar to like Compton, I think the study was done in Compton, um, actually have higher rates of compounded PTSD than youth who are experiencing um, actual war in other countries. Um, and it's because blacks, black kids in these neighborhoods are experiencing so many back-to-back -back, um, traumatic instances, whether it's encounters with the police, family members being killed, you know, socially engineered poverty, all kinds of things just, and they don't have any time to process that they actually have um, like compounded and extremely extended um, issues with trauma. So I'm coming from that body of work, really looking at trauma broadly, but also mediated by race, if that helps. Yeah, that's great, thanks. So one of the things I thought was really interesting in your talk was, it, was almost, it wasn't a postscript of talk that just got sprinkled in throughout. It was this idea of the other side of trauma, which is joy. Mm -hmm. And I wondered a little bit if you could talk a little bit more about, from this perspective that you're coming from, like what are the, not just the origins of the joy in your systems and, and where joy comes from, but also how is it potential to perpetuate or encode joy? Because joy felt very fleeting compared to some of the other structural issues. Yeah, so in the program, we also, so I normally am very explicit with my students about making joy centered. Um, and I do that in a lot of ways. I actually, you know, I laugh a lot with them. I, I code switch a lot. I storytell a lot. I do all of the things that Black folks do every day to bring joy in these moments. Um, but I'm also very explicit that, like, we're going to, uh, CRT tells us we have to problem pose. We have to be able to name the systems that harm us but we also have to solution pose, right? We also have to design our way out of white supremacy. Um, and that is an inherently joyous act. Um, and also it's about like, black folks, our dehumanization is so particular. It's about not ever being allowed to be anything except something that's commodified or fetishized. So joy and rest and restoration and all of these other things that are taken for granted, playing, all of those things are like radical. So this program is very like play centered um, or, yeah, we're like, you know, what is it called? Playing the dozens, like we're joking, we're doing like mixtapes, like we're like having the time of our lives in these programs, which is why their their projects end up being so hilarious because the, the joy is at the center. It's been at the center pedagogically the entire time. Um, and so, and, and, and in the, the um, rubric, I actually say it should be, your project should center joy in some way. And you should be able to explicitly name how that was. 
whether it was you were laughing the entire time you were researching it, or it's actually like a funny name or, you know, whatever it is. Um, they also did like commercials, like they just did they, this group was like a commercial that was like so hilarious where they like acted it out. Um, but yeah, so so we were very particular about joy and and had a broad view of it and why it was important, right? That we are never allowed to have joy, and therefore that it's gonna be centered here. Um, so just to follow up on that, I, I do think just from, you know, having Tara as part of our research team too, there's sort of like a embodied way that you inhabit these spaces that I think is really important. And it kind of, I mean, that's one thing that I've been learning is it's like just the, it's kind of this wax on wax off. It's like an embodied way of doing the work and engaging with young people that I think is, I don't know, it's, it feels like something that is in the joy work, but in a way it's like, I don't know, it's not, it, it, I would just encourage you to like amp, amp it up in some way. I'm not even sure how you describe it, but um, yeah, like when you were developing, like I listened to the interviews that Tiara does with um, youth of color and I'm like, wow, that's different. <laughs> it's yes. just different, right? So, and the joy part feels like it's really integrated. So that was just a reflection. Um, I have a less, uh, more, maybe more of a bummer question. Oh, but, um, so I feel like what you're doing with young people and when you inhabit space with them, it's really powerful and you can see the outcomes of it. It's really clear um, and inspiring. I know you've also worked in spaces that are more traditional, mm -hmm. but still progressive in orientation about computer science access. So the imagination of like computer science for all and all the like APCS and all of this is like, like a lot of the folks in this community are kind of part of, we're in a computer science, you know, ICS, and there's a lot of folks who teach software and want to expand equity and opportunity to coding and all of that good stuff. Yeah. But what you're doing looks and feels really different from what most of that broadening participation mm -hmm. stuff looks like. Can you speak to just like, if you see like, where are the faces of opportunity? Are you feeling optimistic about any movement in that space? Or like, what's the vibe for you about getting this stuff institutionalized, whether it's in like high schools or yeah. in higher ed or whatever? Oh, that is a better question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I have hope. I think I, I engage in freedom dreaming. So yeah. I, I have hope. Um, so actually this summer, because you know, I know I texted you last night, but we just got a grant for our third year um, for this project. Thank <laughs> you. Very like late in the middle of the night. I was like, oh my God, please. Um, but so uh, with this grant, we're actually going to be inviting formal computer scientists, Black computer scientists, in to teach us some traditional coding. And we're going to build out a curriculum that we're hoping to then test in schools. So this is like a first step. So I don't have any answers. But my hope is that in the next couple of years with more of the like infrastructure of like grants and like other folks who are in formal CS that we can actually like, you know, build this out. And, and one of the things I'm excited about is co-teaching with someone in computer science, um, because I think that that's one of the ways we can think about how to do this differently, but still within the confines of like the classroom, right? Like the, the 45 minutes to like an hour and a half units that we're normally given. There's some help. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you for your talk. Um, it's clear that a lot of your work has implications all over the place, uh, both in and out of tech. But I was wondering what educators could take away from this work, um, also in and out of tech, so in the arts and physical sciences, literature, language, because it seems as if your students are really engaged, um, learning a lot and able to implement that learning in a way that's uncommon. Yeah, um, I think one of the ways I've seen it be take, taken up most frequently is in like um, critical algorithmic literacy. So I've been talking and, and theorizing about like, how do we make these systems more apparent even outside of a CS class, right? Um, and so I've been, yeah, I've, I've, I've been doing a lot of work in different, um, like I've been in the social work field. Um, I've, I've 
doing stuff with like mental health practitioners and then also like in schools with teachers training them on how to talk about algorithmic racism, how to talk about digital wellness, um, little like mini lessons that they can embed into their um, classrooms um, and talking about how to do this in, a, in an interdisciplinary way. Because I also say, and I didn't say this today, but I feel like this is a good juncture to say it, that obviously I'm not a formally trained computer <laughs> science scientist, um, but uh, the reason I engage in, in information science and CS and whatever else the way that I do is because my dad actually hacked his way into computer science. Um, so my dad was working at Burger King when he was younger. And while he was working at Burger King, he decided he wanted to be a computer science. So he rented some books from the library and taught himself how to code and then managed to get a job as a janitor in a computer science building. And as he was the janitor, continued to learn the code. And when he was taking the trash out, was at the presentations watching them present and then became the mail carrier in there and eventually worked his way up to a computer scientist. Um, and so I learned from him that I could hack my and had no degree. Right. I learned I could hack my way into these systems and like a backdoor entry. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the other side of that, why I do hope is because as a black man in the computer science world in the 80s, right, he experienced a lot of that racial trauma and unfortunately did have um, a mental health breakdown eventually. And so now I take care of him and I saw how these systems break you, right? And so I want to prepare students to go into these fields and not only survive, right, but to thrive and to change them. Oh, that sounds like a really difficult endeavor for students who maybe haven't been exposed to that kind of education in the past. Mm. Can you talk about some of like, if there were any like cases of emotional responses mm. or you know, I imagine it could be a little bit triggering and like how you navigate that as an educator. Yes. So I think the pedagogy is always centered in like home places, um, which is like Bell Hook's notion of like caring, deeply caring for children in ways that prepare, like heal them and humanize them and speak explicitly about racism where you prepare them to be able to survive these systems. Um, but you also like love on them and you you talk about, uh, it's like you're processing everything together, right? It's like a really watered down way of talking about it. Um, so no matter where I'm teaching, I'm always like, the goal is to make these systems visible, as I said, or like I say this to the kids, right? We're going to talk about these systems, we're going to talk about things that are, are stressful um, and painful, but we're also going to talk about how we continue to survive them and center hope. So some days we don't even talk about racism, like racism is not on the agenda every single day. Like sometimes we just sit together and we're like watching Black Mirror, like the fun episodes, you know, <laughs> which there's like two of <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's engaging in that type of that. I think that's what is um, brings them hope. But we also are very so this isn't a program. Right. And the program is a critical race program. So it's not just me by myself. Um, and this program is now in its like 18th or 19th year. So I'm this class is relatively new. I've been involved in the program for like 10 years, I think. Um, but we've worked really intentionally to have wellness resources built in. So they have a racialized yoga class, like yoga for survivors. Um, they have, we have all kinds of folks that we have a mental health practitioner who's trained in racial trauma. Um, we do all kinds of like very intentional caretaking so that, because it's, it's debilitating to constantly be told everything is trying to kill you, you know? Um, so we, we, yeah, it's a really robust program, but care is definitely at the center so that, because we don't want to, break them down we, we're showing them this so that they can survive it right and so by the end we actually do interview them interview them at the end and they say that they feel empowered by the end they're like i didn't feel hopeless i actually before i took this class i felt hopeless right now i feel like i'm gonna f some shit up okay well if there's no other questions i think timing is perfect to continue the conversation reception. Thank you. Thank you.